Professor at the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney. And before heading there, he was the Senior Vice President for Asia, Japan and a Henry Kissinger Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He was also Director of Asian Studies and a Chair in Modern and Contemporary Japanese Politics and Foreign Policy at the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. Dr. Green has served on the staff of the National Security Council and is a, a senior advisor on Asia in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. He's also worked in Japan on the staff and on the staff of a member of the National Diet. He has authored numerous books and articles on East Asian security, holds a black belt in Lado, and do you have your bagpipes with you this evening? I understand that you've won many international pri prizes on the Great Highland Bagpipe. I'll and bring them next time. Next time, next time. <laughs> Speaking with Dr. Uh, Dr. Green is Mark Watson, who is the director of the DC office of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. His career as a diplomat and national security official has included postings in Port Moresby, Hong Kong, Singapore, London, and most recently at the Australian Embassy in Washington, DC. He has served on a range of senior interdepartmental committees, including Operation so Sovereign Borders, and in his most recent role, Counterterrorism Coordination and Oversight Committees. He is a trained Chinese linguist and a regular contributor on national security and U.S. policy issues on the afternoon agenda program on Sky News and is a national security contributor to the Australian newspaper. We also uh, have with us this evening our moderator, Dr. Kristen Vacassi of the School of Policy and International Affairs at the University of Maine in Orono. She is an associate professor of political science and her research focuses on international political economy in the Indo-Pacific and the geopolitics of supply chains. She specializes in Northeast Asia and has spent years conducting research in China, Japan, and South Korea. Her book, Risk Management Strategies of Japanese Companies in China, explores how Japanese multinational corporations mitigate political risk in China. Prior to joining the faculty at the University of Maine, she taught at New College of Florida, was a visiting research fellow at the University of Tokyo, and a Fulbright fellow at Tohoku University. She's a member of the Mansfield Foundation's US-Japan Network for the Future and a non-resident fellow at the National Bureau of Asian Research. In 2021 to 2022, she was an academic associate at the Harvard University US-Japan program. Kristen, thank you also for being with us. It's really uh, our privilege to have the expertise up at the School of Policy and International Affairs with us and as part of our programming. Before I turn things over to you, Kristen, I want to thank the audience for logging in this evening, especially the Political Science Club from SMCC, who I am told on authority is having a watch party. Um, pay close attention because I understand there will be a quiz. We look forward to hearing everyone's questions this evening, and you can put them in the question and answer box at any time during the presentation. Thank you again. Kristen, I'm going to turn things over to you. Welcome. Great. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to getting this discussion started. Um, so a few months back, I spoke with an Australian reporter and I was talking about the extent to which Australian minerals and mining and mineral expertise um, could be important for the United States. And the reason he wanted to talk to me is because Maine is just about as far from Australia as a person can get um, and be in the United States. And he wanted the most distant perspective. And tonight we are we are so lucky um, that this this evening or um, morning for for Dr. Green um, that we are going to be able to bring home to Maine some of these perspectives of Australia and really think through um, a lot of the the issues of and, and get these global perspectives. Um, so as we're going to discuss over the next 
the next hour or so, uh, US-Australia relations, I think, are at, really at the core of a lot of the big global issues that are going to define the trajectory of prosperity, of stability, of security of the of the next of the, the coming decades. Um, we see we will, we will we see Australia and the US at the center of issues of US-China rivalry and competition, and also at over regional power and competition in the, the Asia Pacific or the or the Indo-Pacific. Um, I see a lot of uh, aspects of raw material and resource diplomacy, as well as competition and cooperation in science, technolo uh, uh, science, technology, environmental cooperation, and of course, in security cooperation as well. And so Australia is a key partner. And over the next hour, let's we're going to start to um, unpack these issues with these two distinguished guests and get a handle more on the complicated history as well as the contemporary um, politics. Um, so Dr. Green, I'm going to start with a question, a broad question for you, um, and ask you to give us sort of a broad overview of the US secure of US Australia security relations and the US Australia alliance, and particularly thinking about historic factors that have led to the current structure that we have today and what you see is the most most important components for us to pay attention to in the US-Australia alliance today. So in particular, right, what do you see as the problems that the um, that AUKUS um, is trying to solve and the points of greatest potential to maybe solve those problems? Um, thanks very much, Kristen, and um, good to be with you, Mark. Um, I feel like we switched places somehow. One-on-one um, uh, -on -one trade, they got, they got a better deal, I think. <laughs> um, but um, it's great to be in Sydney. I like you, Kristen. I spent the first part of my career um, deep, deep, deep on Japan. I was a Fulbright in Japan too. I've, I've written several books on the US-Japan alliance, um, and I hope we get to Japan a little bit because the Japan-Australia nexus is really important. Um, and now that I'm deep into the US-Australia alliance, it's it's reaffirming what I always knew, which is while Japan is in terms of um, scale our most important ally. We have no close rally in the Indo Pacific, maybe in the world, than Australia. Um, and yet, it is a much more complicated and, and nuanced alliance than even Americans in government uh, really fully understand. Um, and it's it's a it's a very strong alliance. We, you know, in in um, in 1918, when American troops, Illinois National Guard, first showed up on the Western Front in World War One, they were told you cannot fight under British command. We were still pretty anti-British, but they were allowed to fight under General Monash and the Australians. And on July 4th, 1918, at the Battle of Hamel, um, you know, U.S. troops went into combat really for the first time under Australian generals. Um, and ever since then, we have been in more um, trenches and naval battles together than we have even with the British, um, um, including Vietnam and things the British sat, sat out. So incredibly tight. When I worked for the White House for President Bush and the NSC staff, I remember going to Korea and we went deep inside the U.S. command to get our briefing on the North Korea threat. And the general who gave us the briefing in an American command was an Australian general. Because as Mark would know, we have embeds, we have senior people in each other's intelligence and, and military and diplomatic structures. So it's very, very, it's very, very close, very intimate. Um, uh, but now we're in a new chapter where, um, you know, for the first time, the, the, the real challenges and threats we're dealing with are not in the Middle East. Um, uh, they're really right in, in, in the center of Asia with the rise of China and uncertainty about China's intentions. And, and what that means to me in this chapter of the Alliance is we have a security, mutual security treaty. Um, uh, I should add, by the way, one of the most poignant moments for me was just, I was in the White House on 9-11. And John Howard, the Australian Prime Minister, was in Washington. And you know, those of us in the White House were angry and scared and sad on that day. Um, and I remember Condoleezza Rice telling us, uh, John Howard, the Australian Prime Minister, just told President Bush, he's going to invoke Kansas, uh, our alliance, because Australia is going to come to our defense, um, something we never thought of in the alliance. We always thought of it as the American responsibility to defend Australia, and here was a seminal moment that was quite emotional for us, quite powerful. Well, now we're in even, an even more intense moment where um, we're looking at this China challenge. And what it means is um, Americans and Australians are gonna be even more intimately intertwined than ever before. So AUKUS is one example. The United States is going to transfer nuclear propulsion you know, 
attack submarine technology to another country for the first time in 1957. So that Australia has these submarines, this capability to defend itself. We need Australia to have that capability. Um, we, we are um, uh, looking at challenges in the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait that are right there. And so I just end by saying this shows how close we are, how intimate we are, how much we trust each other, but how complicated it is. Because now what I'm hearing in Australia is, how does Australia maintain its sovereignty? You know, if we have jointly crewed submarines with Americans and British and Australian officers under this AUKUS deal, how does that work? We've never really done that before. If we're talking about contingencies right near Australia or the deployment of American forces increasingly in Australia, how does that work? And Australians are very serious about their sovereignty at the same time they are about the alliance. And then on the US side, you know, are we going to be agile enough to transfer the technology to do what we're saying with Australia? We're becoming very interdependent. Um, and that's making this very, very close alliance, you know, even more complicated in a way and, and nuanced and subtle. So I'm glad I'm glad you're focused on it. Uh, great, thank you so much, um, um, Mark. I'm going to uh, turn to you and ask you maybe to to contextualize the the U.S. Australia alliance a little bit more in the in the broader region. Um, um, going going off of um, Mike's Mike's comments, um, in particular, thinking about how you see right, the broader region, but also mini lateralism, right, these relatively small groups of countries that are focused on uh, cooperating on more focused issues. Um, how do those work in the region? What are some of the challenges you see? Um, and then also to, to think about this broad question that I also asked Dr. Green of what do you see the U.S.-Australia uh, alliance and also AUKUS trying to solve? Um, and what are the your greatest points of potential that you see? Okay, uh, many thanks, Kristen, and uh, many thanks, Mike, for laying the table so expertly there. I appreciate it. Um, whenever I hear that story around Australian U.S. troops in the First World War, it strikes a personal note with me because my grandfather was actually in the field artillery supporting the Australian and US troops uh, in that advance and uh, something of course I, I was too young and too thick to talk to my grandfather about but uh, having done research subsequently I know where he was but thank you um, and to those uh, listening online I hope you have engaged with uh, Australia's greatest cultural export uh, Bluey so that uh, my accent isn't too startling for you all and you can actually understand what I'm saying. Look, um, Kristen, in, in, in trying to put this into some regional context, um, I always fall back on the two great immutables, uh, geography and history. And it's very worthwhile for someone really trying to understand AUKUS and its significance for Australia to really get a map out and have a look at where we are. We take up a big chunk of the Southern Hemisphere. We are the hinge of the Indo-Pacific down there. We, if you look out to the east across the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean, you eventually bump into America, having passed over a bunch of our very close uh, friends and neighbours in small Pacific Island countries. If you look to the west, you see straight across the vast expanse of the Indian Ocean until you bump into India. And if you go north, as, as Mike's already alluded to, eventually you go straight up to Japan. And that kind of structure, that east-west and then north-south axis, is really critical in understanding this whole situation. As for the history, while uh, the, the, the facts may remain uh, immutable, the fact is the view of history can be very different, and particularly the view of the history of Australian and United States engagement in our region, uh, in Southeast Asia in particular, also to, with respect to the Pacific to a certain extent, but particularly in Southeast Asia, the view of the history of that engagement in Jakarta or Hanoi or Phnom Penh is very different from the view of that history in London, Washington or Canberra. And we need to bear that in mind when looking at the regional context. We need to be very respectful of that. And what we found when the AUKUS announcement was made that it was not uh, received with universal applause uh, in our part of the world. Indeed, our two nearest northern Asian neighbours in Indonesia and Malaysia were quite uh, initially at least, quite critical, they had some legitimate and genuine concerns around the spread of uh, nuclear material into what had been a nuclear-free area. They were concerned that it could trigger 
an arms race, although I think those of us who've been following China closely realize that arms race started quite some time ago. Um, but nonetheless, we need to take that into account. And what that has done is it's meant that Australia in particular, but the US as well, has had to kickstart its program of engagement in Asia and the Pacific. And I mean, Southeast Asia in particular and, and the Pacific. And so as we, our diplomats and our politicians are going into the region to explain AUKUS, it's not to explain why it's of value to us, it's to explain why it's of value to our partners in the region. It's about trying to redress the current strategic imbalance in that part of the world. It's about trying to ensure that there is a better ability to protect the uh, peace and security of the region more generally. So it's part of the AUKUS arrangement doesn't stand alone. It's part of an interlocking geometry of um, agreements, treaties, arrangements uh, that have been you know, spinning out now for some time. You know, if you just list off some of them, um, RCEP, uh, CPTPP, APEC, IPEF, ANZUS, the Quad, the Trilateral Security Arrangement, Australia, US, Japan, um, the Five Eyes Arrangement uh, between you know, Australia, US, UK, New Zealand and Canada. All of these have some common, common elements. And when looking at the regional context, it's a giant Venn diagram of minilaterals and minilateral arrangements. And if you drill down into that um, Venn diagram, right in the middle, the smallest part of overlap is Australia. And that's not by chance. I think the Australian government, the previous government and the current government, uh, there was a change of politics in Australia uh, last year, but both of them recognize that these kind of minilateral arrangements are critical to ensuring uh, cohesion and buy-in uh, across our region. But in the middle of that, none, none of those agreements is more critical to our uh, security future than, than AUKUS. As for the problem that uh, AUKUS is trying to solve, well, in one word, China. In two words, uh, strategic deterrence. And uh, I use strategic deterrence quite deliberately rather than strategic competition, because frankly, I don't think the language of competition is fit for the times anymore. I think we've moved into a different phase of relations with, with, with China. Um, as far back as the 2009 white paper in Australia, the defence white paper, um, the Australian government of the day was calling out the threat posed by China as in the long run being of greater significance to Australia than building an expeditionary force such as we'd had in Afghanistan and Iraq. And it was really built on the back of the work, the work done by Australia's, uh, to my mind, uh, uh, most brilliant forward thinking bureaucrat in Mike Pizzullo, uh, who at the time was the deputy, <laughs> was the deputy uh, secretary of defense. And Mike, if you're watching, you're welcome. Um, he was Deputy Secretary of Defence at the time, and he wanted to emphasise this point about the really big strategic picture wasn't the engagements in Afghanistan, in Iraq. At some point, they were going to end, but the threat posed in our region would continue on well into the future. And it, even as far back as 2006, he, he said something which I think is really, really uh, germane to why we are where we are today. He said, you have to keep your eyes on the fact that we live in a predominantly maritime environment and that state on state issues might well come back into play. Well, how right he was, state on state issues have definitely come back into play. We continue to live in a, a predominantly maritime environment. And so finding a way to project power and to project threat and risk and harm to a potential adversary a long way away from Australia, which is not available, to us at the moment. We don't have that strategic deterrent. That is at the core for Australia of why AUKUS is important. Thanks so much. Um, I, I, I would like to hear a little bit, bit more from you, Mark, about, so this is, I see the importance and I hear that. And what are some of the, maybe the challenges, the roadblocks to, to achieving that? Um, and also what are some of the, I mean, what are some of the things that AUKUS is not, right? What problems does it not solve? Um, but, and I'd also, as a, a follow-up to something you said, I'd like to hear about this, about um, engagement in Southeast Asia and in Pacific Islands, and maybe about some of the maybe challenges of Chinese counter diplomacy um, mm -hmm. to, to, to answering those questions. Great, thank you. Do you want me to kick off or Mike? Yeah, if you can kick off, and then Mike, I'm gonna ask you to um, jump in. Okay. And, 
Uh, look, from, us, my, from my perspective, it, it is important, very important to understand what AUKUS isn't. Uh, it's not a new defence pact. It's not a new defence treaty. It doesn't sign us up to any new obligations in that regard. That sits with the ANZUS agreement, the Australia, New Zealand, United States agreement. In fact, AUKUS is principally a technology accelerator. It's a about building pathways to either create ab initio, new technology at the highest end of the spectrum that is applicable in national security environment, or in the case of the submarines, as you know, uh, Mike has already alluded to, the transfer of, of, of high-end capability. Um, AUKUS also is not a near-term fix. Um, it's going to take time, a long time, before we get a submarine, for example, that is built for Australia, crewed by Australians. Uh, could be the late 2030s. Hence, we expect to hear a lot more about interim solutions, uh, how to fill the gap, and don't need to go into that right now. But um, the other thing is, it's not an agreement that displaces. It's not an agreement that displaces other agreements. It's an add-on. It doesn't displace the Five Eyes. It doesn't displace uh, the Quad. Uh, or the trial act, Any, it, it's an add-on, it's a very significant add-on, but that's important. Um, and it's not a turning away from regional engagement. I think maybe the, some people have tried to portray it as a, you know, falling back on old alliances. It's not, it's about ensuring, frankly, that the United States has another tether into our part of the world. It's about saying that we want the US engaged in the Indo-Pacific and in Asia Pacific in particular. And it's another, uh, if you like, strand in the rope that will do that. Uh, the challenges are legion. I won't go into them all. Uh, some are legal and regulatory. Uh, the US has, for very good reason, a very uh, tight uh, export control regime, but it's cumbersome. It's uh, labyrinthine. I think even uh, US colleagues who have had to work through that will admit to that for straight up. Um, we need to find, if you like, um, you know, an AUKUS premier lane that you can, you know, get stuff moving a bit quicker. Uh, some issues are practical. How are we going to crew these submarines? I mean, the US and Australia are both experiencing recruitment challenges in the military generally. It's even harder to find people who will happily spend months away submerged in a steel tube with some of their nearest and dearest living right beside them. Um, and that's before you get to the workforce needed to build uh, and maintain these vessels. So there's a workforce issue. But if I could sum it up in one big, with one big bow on top, I think the biggest challenge for AUKUS is what I would describe as organizational inertia in the United States. And I'm not saying that um, as a pejorative meaning that people are deliberately dragging their heels. I'm saying the machine here is big in a way that most Australians can't even comprehend how big the military machine is, how big the bureaucracy is, you know, how big, you know, every part of this, the, the Congress, the political side of it. And so there's a lot that has to happen. You know, there's a great big devil lurking in a mountain of detail here. And it requires uh, sympathetic Congress people, congressmen and women to advance this in Congress, push it through committees, including committees that don't normally deal with military and national security issues and so it's, there's an educational role before people will say yeah okay we'll support this but it's about you know changing uh, it's about developing new processes and policies it's about legislation and regulation um, and it's it's also fundamentally about changing a decades long uh, uh, natural inclination to pull everything in and hold on to it tight and not release it uh, and for AUKUS to be successful, there really has to be a fundamental shift in the psychology of no foreign, no foreigners, to yes foreign, or at least these foreigners, uh, meaning AUKUS. And that's hard. All of that is built, you know, hardwired into a very big system. Those are very real challenges uh, for AUKUS. Thanks so much. So, um, yeah, please, yeah, jump right in. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with what Mark said. He, he cataloged the opportunity in the... And the and the obstacles and I, as I as I listened to him going through the obstacles, I thought I'm I'm, I'm glad I'm in a think tank now and not back in government because those are those are going to be tough. Mike Pizzullo, who Mark mentioned earlier, who is one of these sort of iconic senior officials here, um, I, I saw him when I was in the White House and he was in defense, and uh, we were U.S. and Australia were working side by side in Iraq and Afghanistan around the world, and I asked him how's it going, and he said, well, we're doing more together than ever. Um, the other day, um, we needed to get a truck for some of our forces in Afghanistan. So I went to the Pentagon and the general I was talking to said, stop, stop. Don't ask 
the US military for a truck. We don't know how to do that. Ask us for a thousand trucks <laughs> that we know how to do. <clears throat> so the Australian Defense Force is, is actually smaller than the US Marine Corps. Um, and so th that's, and, and yet we are incredibly tight. And, 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 and so that's part of the challenge for Australia is getting through the American bureaucratic machine. Now, AUKUS is an agreement that President Biden himself announced with former Prime Minister Scott Morrison and former Prime Minister Boris Johnson in the UK. It has top-down White House support. And I think we, we, we will break through some of these things that Mark's talking about. On the why um, AUKUS, to me, um, it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. In 1995, 96, we had our first real crisis with, with China after the Cold War. Um, uh, over Taiwan. And, and the Chinese military bracketed Taiwan with missile shots and military exercises. And I was in the Pentagon uh, at the time. And in response, the US sent two US carrier battle groups um, from Japan, lollygagging, just taking their time down the first island chain, past Hainan Island. And there wasn't a thing the Chinese could really do about it. Today, that first island chain from Japan through the Taiwan and the Philippines the Chinese have absolutely covered it with um, artificial islands, that four of them with massive bases, um, more tactical aircraft than the U.S. or Japan have, you know, a giant, quote unquote, Coast Guard, which is basically Navy ships with the hulls painted white, just a massive amount of firepower. Um, that means a couple things. One is for Australia, um, defense officials find that they used to think that Australia had 10 years warning time before they would face a threat. That's gone. China is now able to reach out and touch Australia tomorrow. Um, and for the US, it means it's a much more difficult contested environment and for Japan. The one area where the Chinese are still well behind the US and our allies is submarines, is undersea warfare, where some estimates are we're 10 to 20 years ahead of them in our, in our capabilities. And in a contested maritime environment, if you dominate undersea, that's, to Mark's point, that's very powerful deterrence. So that's why zero warning time uh, before a crisis, you know, Chinese capabilities, the envelope of the threat coming out all the way so it can touch Australia. How do you keep our friends in Beijing thinking it's not a good idea to attack Taiwan? It's not a good idea to use force. Keep that edge undersea. And that's why the whole US system is now gearing up to do something we haven't done since 1957, which is give a close ally some of the most sensitive technology we have. So they have that ability to put nine, probably Mark, nine or 10 more boats in the water to keep that deterrence and that balance so that we can you know, bend history and sort of get back to a better relationship with China. The fact this will take 15, 20 years tells you that the governments realize this problem with China is not going away in 10 or 15 years. But in the long sweep of history, we want to get back to a better relationship. Mike, Mike could you talk a little bit about how, a little bit more about how um, AUKUS is being perceived in the broader region, and and how I mean, certainly how, how China perceives it, but then maybe the contestation over narratives and understandings of of AUKUS in the Indo-Pacific region. So. The big maritime powers that are worried about China are very enthusiastic. And that would be Japan and India in particular, and I think Korea as well, although they're a bit quieter about it. Um, my Australian friends are always much more sensitive to Southeast Asian reactions than Americans are. And you know, there is a certain amount of whinging in Southeast Asia about you know, introducing nuclear technology and uh, and all of that, I'm not as concerned about it uh, as some friends in, in Canberra, but they're closer and these relationships are pretty intimate and important for Australia. I think um, in my experience, when you talk to the defense ministries in Indonesia, uh, the Philippines, uh, Malaysia, all countries that have serious maritime disputes with China and see the same challenge that the US and Australia see, when you talk to the defense ministries, they quietly think it's really good. It's the foreign ministries and the academics um, who tend to be a little more concerned about UN uh, commitments, multilateralism, um, denuclearization of the region that tend to get more spun up. Um, I think we'll get through it. And I think that Canberra has done, a, I think the Albanese government here has done a good job and Penny Wong, the foreign minister, kind of calming the waters and, and attending to that. And, you know, 
the US has, has sort of followed suit and done better too. Um, the challenge we have is that this narrative, as you mentioned, Kristen, is actively being um, uh, pushed by China. And the Chinese over the last few years have been begun using Russian style social media bots and other ways to drive traffic. Um, and they're tapping into some things Mark pointed to. The, 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 these are post-colonial states, Indonesia um, and Malaysia. And it's not hard for the Chinese to find an audience that will say, wait a minute, these are the imperial powers, the British, the Americans. You know, so the Chinese put out social media, you know, sort of playing up that, playing up the white Anglosphere. And there's an audience for that. And it's pretty active. But I think we have a pretty good story to tell because um, at the end of the day, the, the US and Australia um, are about helping these countries defend their sovereignty too and being more resilient. And I think we have a good story to tell, but we are playing catch up. I, Mark's Institute asked me, does a lot of work on this. I think you'd agree. We are definitely playing catch up on some of these contested narratives in the region. Yeah, just to pick up Mike's point, I agree wholeheartedly. I, if you look, there actually hasn't been a lot recently, and I would say for the last year almost, maybe less, but a um, bit less from Indonesia or Malaysia. Malaysia will probably be implacably opposed just because it's Australia, and that's just kind of the way things roll. Uh, Indonesia, I agree with you entirely, Mike. Um, they, are, I think, are, have gone, okay, we raised our objections. The IAEA have sort of semi become involved, but they're happy with the, the steps and the explanations and the fact that this is all going to be done inside the existing rules that we want everybody to play by. It's being done in a safe and secure way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there has been a really excellent diplomatic effort. And, and you know, the US definitely as well is now stepping up, obviously in the Pacific, uh, you know, building new embassies, sending more diplomats. Um, I used to jokingly say that here in Washington, you know, you can't throw a rock down the street without hitting a China expert, but, you know, you can let off a shotgun and not hit a Pacific expert. You know, there's not many, you know, here in Washington who have built careers, not that I'm trying to let off a shotgun in Washington, just to be clear in place, you know, you know but, uh, you know, uh, but it, it, there are very few people who have built careers in a Pacific stream, whereas in Australian diplomacy, certainly when I was still going through the department, there was a whole stream of people who would go from Pacific Island country to Pacific Island country, maybe step out, do one of the job and, and finish up there. So there was that body of expertise. Uh, just one point, uh, you know, really, it's important to make is the impact that China's own actions have had on all this. It was China that laid the groundwork for this. And it was because of their behavior in the South China Sea, uh, you know, the, 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 the way uh, the unveiling of treatment of uh, Uyghurs, for example, inside China, the, you know, behavior in Hong Kong, but then in Australia, very, very particularly about uh, economic coercion. I mean, Australia, uh, since that white paper I talked about was written, has been subject to some quite extraordinary, uh, not just economic coercion, but uh, political interference uh, with our politicians and political parties, diaspora intimidation in Australia, on a scale that really led Australia, not just the government, but the people of Australia, to fundamentally change their view of China. And we know that for a fact because um, a think tank in Australia called the Lowy Institute uh, every year runs a survey, the Lowy Poll, that tests Australians' attitudes towards the US, China, national security, defence, a whole range of issues. And in 2018, when Lowy ran that poll in Australia, 82% of Australians, 82, that's a very large majority, saw China fundamentally as an economic partner, not as a security threat. If you fast forward three years, 82% had dropped to 34% of Australians. About one in three Australians thought that China was principally an economic partner, not a national security threat. Flip that on its head, that reverse of that thought that it wasn't a security threat to Australia. That's a huge you know, turnaround. Um, and that uh, that kind of um, behaviour by China informed not just public opinion in Australia, but political opinion in Australia on both sides of the political divide. Uh, it is very much a bipartisan policy. And um, the, in some ways, China's got no one to blame but itself that this, this August agreement has, has, has been reached.
Wow, that's that's so interesting about that that poll. I, there's really similar dynamics that happened in South Korea um, after the the uh, retali uh, excuse me retaliation against Thad, as well as in Japan. You see really similar public opinion dynamics after the uh, you know, economic retaliation against Japanese companies with territorial disputes. Um, and yeah, no, I think that that seems absolutely right. And I'm glad you pivoted a little bit to the economy. So I have a question about that. But before I ask it, I want to encourage um, the audience to put questions into the into the Q&A and we're certainly going to um, have time to get to audience questions. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in hearing um, some of your perspectives on this economic security nexus um, re and relationship. And particularly, I want to turn a little bit to the United States here. Um, where do you think there's potential for cooperation or maybe also some, some friction um, between the United States and Australia in the context of this new appetite for industrial policy and industrial policy related to security in the United States. Um, and I'm particularly thinking about things like raw material requirements in some new US policies like the Inflation Reduction Act, um, maybe some others, but and in general, these ideas of how how the how dependence on China and the you know, economic security nexus and the balance of economic relationships might play out in the future. And um, Mike, Mike, I'll turn to you uh, first for this for this question. Well, we um, at the US Studies Center, we um, we've done surveys as well um, of the not just the Australian people, the Australian, American and Japanese people. Um, you can find it on the website, but one of the things we really um, looked into was thinking about economic security. Um, and there's very close alignment by the American, Australian, and Japanese people on this question. So we asked questions like, how much more would you pay for a cell phone if you were told it's not made in China? And Americans and Australians and Japanese all said like three, four hundred dollars US more. Now, when they go to the Apple store, maybe they don't think that anymore, but it was a bit of an indication of how they think about uh, the, the risks of depending on China for things like 5G with Huawei uh, uh, or semiconductor exports from US or Japan. Um, the American Australian publics, two thirds thought we were too dependent on China economically. Um, so there's clearly a, a broad um, appetite among allies. In surveys I did at CSIS, we found uh, similar things in Korea and Western Europe. But when we asked the question at CSIS or here in Australia, um, what do you think about decoupling from China? Containment, no economic activity. You never get more than 20% of the public saying that's a good idea. You think about, you think about you know, Western Australia with massive exports of coal and stuff. You think about you know, much of the Midwest with soybean uh, exports to China um, or consumers importing from China. So the publics don't want a trade war, um, but definitely there's an appetite for some decoupling or what firms are now calling de-risking. And um, Australia does not have a semiconductor industry, really. So this is mostly a game of the US, Japan, the Netherlands, Korea, Taiwan, but Australia is quickly finding the implications for them are important. Um, and um, uh, in some areas like 5G, Australia was ahead of the US in screening and preventing uh, Huawei from dominating the infrastructure for 5G telecom. Um, you know, because um, that's the backbone uh, for um, uh, an industrial modern society. And there were real concerns because Huawei is required under Chinese law to share all the data, all of it, with the Ministry of State Security and the government. And people don't want that. So we are aligned. Um, and I think if you add up the US, Australia, Japan, um, Canada, you know, um, Korea, the countries that, that have banned Huawei, it's about 60% of the global telecommunications market. Um, uh, but here's the problem we're gonna have. <clears throat> the other 40% is growing because it includes Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, parts of, the, it's the global South. <clears throat> um, we, 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 companies do worry we're heading towards a splinter net where basically you have two artificial intelligence, two 5G systems. And for humanity, that's not great because for those systems to talk to each other, you lose all of the speed that you gain by having AI and 5G. So we're in a very interesting moment in the world where we figured out we need to protect our technology and we're still figuring out how do we do that without hurting all the benefits of the technology. And industrial policy really quickly, the, the, you know, the, the CHIPS Act in the US, the most important piece of industrial policy up until the IRA, the principal author was Todd Young from Indiana, a Reagan Republican free market guy. 
So support for industrial policy in the US is very broad and frankly necessitated by China. The danger for Australia and US allies is that's catnip for protectionists and rates rent seeking. It's very tempting to say, buy American. And I can tell you for Australia, for Japan, for our closest allies, it drives them a little crazy. And in the US, we're gonna to have to figure that out. Um, before, so a couple of points. Um, one is uh, historically, at least, trade is one area that even amongst the closest of friends, it's a pretty cutthroat game. If you can sell your wheat to India cheaper than we can, you win. Um, and that game goes on. Even, you know, as I say, amongst the closest of friends, trade is its own thing. But I will say this, um, it, when Australia was the, on the wrong end of China, just unilaterally shutting down imports of coal, sorghum, beef, wine, live seafood, it was difficult to watch your nearest and dearest friends, I'm looking at you, New Zealand, stepping in to, uh, to fill a gap in the market. I completely understand it. We all completely understand it. But what is interesting is if this form of Chinese coercion leads to some new understanding between like-minded countries, that when one of, you is, one of you is being picked off by China and just under the pump, that we do have some kind of left and right of arc about what's acceptable for our nearest and dearest to do in that space. And so it would be ironic, I think, for China if their overbearing actions in this regard actually create some kind of new system of, hey, we'll all try and hang together as best we can in relation to trade. Uh, in relation to the, um, the US domestic policy, it's clear that US domestic policy is increasingly pushing towards prioritizing the onshoring of a whole range of uh, industries and, and, and manufacturers. And Australia, you just has to accept the reality of that. And Mike's right, it's it, it's irksome in the sense that it goes back to a previous era, which was it's US and everybody else. And countries like Australia keep trying to say, no, 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 it's not the US and everybody else. There's the US, there's your closest allies. And then there's another circle of people who are still good friends. And beyond that is everybody else. But that is a hard message to get into a big system because there are big, Big levers are being pulled, and often, you know, people from Australia is one of the countries that just pings off the far end of the lever. But that just means it's on Australia to recognise what's happening and respond, and we are. And I'll give you an example. Um, Australia's got a lot of rare earths, a lot of critical minerals locked up in Australia outside China, which is a good thing. Um, and uh, just as one example, cobalt, a critical mineral in a whole range of, of, of products. And Australia is the third largest producer of cobalt in the world behind the Democratic Republic of Congo and Russia. So you can see for the US, there's some serious problems with those first two countries for different reasons. You then have Australia, who's not only uh, a producer, but obviously a big miner. So right now, if you were in Idaho, about, um, I don't know, 25 miles west of a place called Salmon, I have never been. Uh, there's an Australian mining company, uh, Jevoice Mining, that is running the only underground cobalt mine in the United States. There's another Australian company there doing something else with cobalt and indeed a Canadian company. But that is the sort of thing where these alliances extend beyond just military hardware. It's about saying, changing a mentality that says sovereignty means I design it, build it and store it in Nevada. And it means I have these other people, these allies, these partners like Australia, who can, if they don't already have it, can develop a highly uh, evolved manufacturing uh, uh, network uh, ecosystem that will support the United States. Remember, AUKUS and everything around it has to deliver something of value to the United States. Otherwise, why be in it? And the fact is, it does, and it will only increase as we realise the potential of the various different pathways that are laid out under AUKUS. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, do you think, do um, Mark, do you think that some of these mini lateral arrangements that we have, the whole Venn diagram of different arrangements, um, do you think that any of those might be fruitful places to pursue this intersection of econ um, economy and security or what people are calling economic security in 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 much of the world particularly um, i'm interested in the quad but sure. i'd be curious about um, broader perspectives yeah look for me the quad is kind of sui generis in its own way it's it's kind of a bit of a 
uh, in between a number of different things. It's neither one thing nor the other. Um, it's not, again, a, a defense treaty. It's, uh, it's a dialogue that's evolved into a whole range of other things. The soft power side of, uh, of a mini lateral, you know, whether it's um, pandemic response or, or you know, public uh, uh, national disaster response, whatever it may be. Um, so it's a little different, but I, I, I think, and I've, I've said for some time now that the lost dimension of national security has been trade. Um, all those things I listed off earlier, you know, uh, the CPTPP, RCEP, uh, IPEF, all those things, of course, they're about um, uh, decreasing the cost of transaction between countries and ensuring that countries are able to maximise their you know, competitive or comparative advantage. But they also have a national security function, which is countries that are tied together like that. Um, a, there's, there's a venue to talk about other things. And when you're Australia and China refuses to take your phone call, neutral ground like a trade dialogue does offer opportunities for, you know, behind the speaker's chair discussions. Um, but also it's about trying to build those threads that bind together a region and give a greater sense of my national economic well-being is tied up with yours as well. Now, that won't always survive great, you know, clashes, but it is part of confidence building. It is part of trying to build a network of interrelationship that gets harder and harder to disentangle when times are tough. So I do think trade is important. I do think minilaterals. The quad I'm not so sure about on the economic front might, might have a view on that. Well, the one area where the quad could be quite important on the economic front is critical minerals, um, because um, the rest of us depend on China for the majority of the critical minerals we use for lithium batteries and, and, and also like sensors on guided missiles. And the reason is because digging critical minerals out of the earth takes a huge amount of water. It's incredibly dirty. And, you know, the Chinese are happy to do it. Um, but Western Australia and Northern Australia, the Northern Territories have vast amounts of these minerals. Um, Canada does, uh, yeah, the, the parts of India do. I was talking to a senior, um, a CEO of a big US multinational who's in this space. And he, he said something really interesting. He said, look, if we're just talking about investing in Western Australia, the scale's not interesting enough. But if the US, Australia, uh, India, and Japan created a framework, like a marketplace for critical minerals based on national security, that could really attract investment. So that is one area that would be interesting for the quad. We'll see if it's possible. Um, and Mark's absolutely right on trade. I, I will promote my one of my books by More Than Providence, A History of American Strategy in the Indo-Pacific. And we've always had trade as a key pillar of our influence, engagement, uh, everything Mark said. And right now we have almost nothing. The US under President Trump pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, now CPTPP, Biden stayed out. He's replaced it with something we now call IPEF, which is kind of like an academic seminar. It's not a real trade negotiation. And um, uh, we have to get back in that game in the US. Interestingly, in public opinion polls, the American people support trade negotiations, trade liberalization more than ever. But the politics of it are just gunked up, just gunked up because of you know our presidential electoral politics primaries. It's a long story. Um, and we, have, we do have to get back in that game if we're serious about the region. It's a really nice transition to one of the questions from the audience here. So somebody asks um, if you think that the Biden administration has done enough to repair the U.S.-Australia relationship that may have suffered some damage during the Trump administration. Um, well, I was in the embassy here in Washington uh, during the transition from President Obama to President Trump, and I think a lot of people, certainly on, on, on this line, who are interested in politics and international relations will recall the famous phone call between our Prime Minister, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, and uh, the President, um, and there were a number of rub points there, but... Um, it created, funnily enough, I will tell you this for a stone cold fact, that it was one of the best things that ever happened to the embassy because we got so many calls from so many different people in so many different parts of the political spectrum, the social spectrum, saying, no, don't, don't, don't listen to that. We we think you guys are great. We think you're a great partner. I don't know why, you know, he's sort of 
dumping on you guys. You're not. And so we had all this, and including in Congress, which effectively reinvigorated reinvigor the moribund uh, Australia, Friends of Australia caucus and bipartisan buy-in. So it's kind of a weird thing, but it's also a good example that under President Trump, when he imposed that those range of punitive tariffs and sort of protectionist measures, again, it was the US and everybody else. And Australia, fortunately, through good work from our ambassador here, Joe Hockey, uh, full disclosure, a former employer of mine, um, and uh, politicians, that we got a carve out. But it was only Australia. Countries like Canada, which are equally staunch partners and allies, and right, they were on the wrong end of a lot of these things that were clearly targeted at China, you know, and particular countries for particular reasons. But again, it's just kind of a blunt instrument and a big lever. Um, I do think the Biden administration and the current uh, Labor uh, Party government in Australia are much more closely aligned on a range of issues. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, I, I just summarise by saying, I don't think the alliance was actually damaged during the presidency of Donald Trump in the way that you may imagine. Australia recognises we have to uh, get along with and work with whatever administration of whatever political stripe is in the White House, and we will work over time to do that. The US and Australia remain allies and partners. Presidents you know, will change. But there is a closer political alignment, I think, between the current administration and the Australian government. And the, the, the really... Um... Interesting thing. I mean, it was painful being in Washington during the Trump administration in many ways. But um, the really interesting thing is that Australia, Japan, India, Korea, th those allies in the front lines of strategic competition with China, they were very disciplined. They, they, you never saw cabinet members or ambassadors or prime ministers attacking Donald Trump the way you often saw European and Canadian leaders attacking Donald Trump. And um, and I think a lot of it was because these allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific just didn't have the room, for, didn't have the luxury to get in that kind of food fight. And I think the public's understood it. Whereas in Europe, everything seemed further away. Um, now with Ukraine and, and China, our European friends are beginning to realize it's a dangerous world. The other thing is, if you look at the Biden administration's strategy for the Indo-Pacific, all the elements, um, you know, the Quad, for example, um, uh, were instituted during the Trump administration. So the Trump administration managed to do pretty good stuff for allies in spite of the president himself. And part of that, candidly, was that the Australian embassy, the Japanese embassy, um, the, the Indians were just disciplined about working with the bureaucracy under Donald Trump to deliver all these results. And when the Biden team came in, they, they wanted to hate it, but they couldn't. The Quad was a pretty good idea, turning it into a foreign ministers and then leader summit and so forth. Um, so it does tell you how important our allies are in kind of writing the ship of American foreign policy when we get a little wobbly. And you don't read about it because you can't, because what Mark saw in the, in the embassy, you can't talk about in the press at the time. It, it requires you know, a real discipline, but it's, it's quite important actually for the US role in the world that we, despite ourselves, do listen to our allies at critical moments. Let's stick with um, our allies in the region for for the next question. Um, particularly, Mike, since we have you here, and we can we can talk and think a little bit more about about um, Japan. Um, and do you do you see the sort of the the deepening security ties and the maybe increased um, security posture in Australia as similar, different from what we're seeing in Japan? Um, is in, I, I, you don't need to compare it too much. You know, I want to keep a little Australia thread here, but maybe also sure. if you could talk a bit about uh, changes in Japan and new national security policy and how that ties into these broader regional dynamics. So the last book I published um, was on Japan. It was called um, Line of Advantage. It was about Abe. Uh, Shinzo, the prime minister, who really consolidated the strategy that Japan um, now follows. And, you know, senior people in Australia, including Richard Marles, the deputy prime minister, have said that Japanese strategic thinking on how to do with China had a big influence on how Australia approached China. And I think the same is true for the Trump and Biden administrations. Japan's been a, something of a thought leader in how you compete with China without having a war and how you partner with minilaterals and everything we're talking about. A lot of that comes from Abe in Japan. Although I often tell my China, Japanese friends, it, it really originally came from Alfred Thayer Mahan and American strategic thinkers. And then the smart ones say, yes, but you got it from the British. So 
you know, success has a thousand fathers, but um, Japan's influence is big. And the Australia-Japanese uh, strategic alignment is just remarkable. I mean, this, you know, there were more people killed in, in Northern Australia by Japanese bombing than Americans were killed in Pearl Harbor. And I mean, Australia suffered from the Japanese um, uh, war uh, in the Pacific War. But um, our surveys show that actually on all these strategic issues, as close as we are with Australia, actually Japan and Australia are even more aligned. 70% of Australians in our surveys want a security treaty with Japan like Australia has with the US. And um, the Japan-Australia strategic relationship is officially in the Japanese system uh, labeled as the most important partnership for Japan after the US. And I think, although it's not quite as official, if you read what you know, this government, the previous government say in their speeches, it's true in Australia too. And so um, this US-Japan-Australia trilateral relationship is really, in my view, the driver uh, of, of strategic thinking in the region. Um, and um, it's a good thing for the US. You know, this is not a contest with China where we're on our own. We have very close and very important allies and partners. After China, the four largest economies in Asia are all democracies. And, um, and, and some of them are our closest friends and some of them like India want to be friends. So uh, it starts with Japan and Australia, but we kind of build off from there, not a NATO, not to contain China, but to help us manage this complexity that we're in. Mark, do you wanna, do you wanna add anything to that? I think it's important to uh, fess up when you're in an, uh, an area not of expertise, and I would put myself in Japan in that uh, in that in that mode. All right. So let me. So there, I see a couple of, of questions from the audience um, that maybe we should we should go go back a little bit and think about both the how AUKUS why giving nuclear subs to Australia is the way it's written how it promotes U.S. security and U.S. U.S. interests, um, but then also the secondary question of of the word concern about whether it, it might accelerate a, a regional or global arms race. Uh, Mike, you're the, maybe you should answer that. It's about US. Uh, well, policy. when we asked the American public in the survey here at the US Study Center about alliances, Americans, and, and interestingly, young Americans in particular, are very pro-alliance. Um, you know, in Australia, the older you get, the more pro-alliance you are with the Americans. But in the U.S., the younger, the more pro-alliance. And I'm, honestly, I think it's a little bit of the Donald Trump effect. If Donald Trump attacked alliances, then younger Americans thought, well, they must be worth something. Um, so always strong support for alliances. When we ask the question, do we need us, you know, does Australia make us safer? Um, usually, before I came to the center, 40%, 45% of Americans would say, yeah, you know, our alliance with Australia makes us safer. But they basically thought, well, we're the big guys, we'll help defend Australia. When we asked the question last year, at the end of the year, um, the number jumped way up. 60% of Americans now say that Australia makes us safe. And that's a broad recognition by the American public of the world we're in and how much we need allies. And so it also explains why um, the Biden administration is doing something that you know, the Bush administration I worked in, uh, Obama, even Trump would not have done, which is transfer this capability, despite all the headaches Mark described, to Australia. Having nine more Australian submarines in the water that are highly capable, that can basically submerge for six to nine months, um, just complicates Chinese planning. It makes it very hard. It adds to our undersea advantage. It makes it very hard for China to think we can use force against Taiwan. So it, does it create an arms race? This is like one of the oldest questions in international relations theory. It's like angels on the head of a pin. You know, yes, there's always the danger of escalation um, and an arms race. On the other hand, you know, look at Munich. <laughs> you know, you don't uphold deterrence and you make it just too tempting for the other side to think they can use force. And we've seen just enough hints from China that they, they, they might willing, willingly use force. I mean, they've killed Indian troops in disputes in the Himalayas. They've swarmed the South China Sea, the East China Sea with Chinese ships. They're ramming Japanese ships. They're boycotting Australia. It, it's not just that China has more power, it's they're using it in ways that are menacing. And so, you know, I think that's why most, on a bipartisan basis in the US and Australia, in Japan, 
conservatives and liberals, there's a recognition of what Mark's saying. We've got to restore the deterrence. We've got to make it too complicated for China to think, you know, using force as a way to deal with Taiwan or other problems. So I, that's where I am. But people on the left or people who are liberal idealists in international relations will say, no, 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 you need arms control. Um, maybe. I'll tell you one thing, though, the Chinese are absolutely not interested in arms control. We're never going to get that with them. So, I mean, I'm afraid that uh, the uh, the um, arms race horse has already bolted. Um, and we are trying to redress an imbalance that's grown, certainly for Australia. And we will, as Mike said, we're, we're, we've got a tiny defence force. I mean, I think the US Coast Guard's about 40,000 and the entire Australian Defence Force is about 60,000. So that's a lot of work for the Army, Navy and Air Force for 60,000 people. There's no way that we have a standalone capability to stop a concerted effort by the Chinese. And I, I said earlier about the maritime domain, you know, and the volume of Australian trade, 99% by weight of our uh, trade comes via sea, in and out, 76% uh, by value. Virtually all of our refined oil comes through these narrow sea lanes. Get the map out I talked about and have a look at the choke points on those, those, those sea lanes. So an ability to project power and to project threat against an adversary, an asymmetric response. This is from Australian perspective. Um, it's a bit like Taiwan's, uh, you know, porcupine, you know, strategy. In Australia, we'd call it the echidna, you know, strategy. Um, but the ability to project threat in an unknown place at an unknown time against an adversary is a deterrent. And deterrent is the name of the game in from here on in, in the certainly the first half of the 21st century. As for the US, all those things that Mike talked about are real, you know, an, a more uh, militarily capable Australia, capable of integrating with the United States forces in its own operations and deployments, or indeed to backfill if Australia said, that's really not, you know, our conflict. But hey, we're happy to take up some of the slack doing this, that, or the other. That also contributes. Plus geography. I come back again to the beginning. Geography is important. Where we are, where you can forward deploy stores, men, material, you know, where you can build bases, facilities, all that adds up to a more capable United States response in the long run. We have a great question from um, from from Larry C, and it's it's turning a little bit to a domestic domestic politics in Australia, and then we'll, we'll we'll turn back to to the alliance. But Larry asks, how would you score the health of democracy in Australia? Both the U.S. and Australia have their share of domestic issues that distract or outright cripple our ability to effectively address complex global challenges. Curious to hear about the domestic political environment in Australia and your perspective on its relevance to Australia being an effective partner on the global stage. I'll say something, Mike, and you can contradict me because you're actually living there and I'm living in the US. Um, look, I think it's fair to say that there is a bigger middle ground in Australia than there is currently in the US. That's the way it seems to me. I mean, I don't think it's saying anything controversial to say there's been a polarization of politics in the US that perhaps wasn't there, you know, 50 years ago. I mean, I wasn't here then, but uh, Australia, the two political parties, um, uh, A, it's good that they're bipartisan on, I think, almost every national security issue. I don't think there's any daylight between them on China, on the US alliance, on AUKUS. You know, where there's a difference has been on environmental issues or... Um, um, Gosh, I don't know what else. Maybe some social welfare issues, uh, issues with our Indigenous Australians would be one. Um, but they're not, to be honest, I don't believe that they're the sort of issues that pull attention away from big national security issues. Um, they are the source of debate and discussion, as they are in lots of countries around the world. But Australia as a whole, I think, has probably pulled a little bit more towards the, uh, well, I know, again, statistically, you can show it that, you know, how we address climate change issues, our belief in, you know, climate change and the need for action of some sort, brackets, whatever that may be, um, has definitely gone up, which was always a Labor Party kind of strength, Green Party, obviously, even stronger. But on national security, honestly, I don't think there's issues that are pulling them away from each other. So you don't get a lot of heated debate or discussion. Even the polling, you know, is very interesting about Australian attitudes towards the US and the alliance. And I'm talking about the Lowy poll, Mike, sorry, not, uh, not your poll. Um, 
But, you know, it's almost like there's a bit of a split personality. Uh, about 77%, three quarters of Australians think the alliance is more likely to drag us into a war in Asia that is contrary to Australian interests. That's a lot, three quarters, right? But then if you ask a question of um, would the US come to Australia's defence? Yeah, about the same number, three quarters go, yeah, they will. Yeah, we, we think they will. And equally, about two thirds um, uh, think that the alliance with the US makes us safer from attack from China. So you kind of go, well, hang on, it doesn't seem like we're worried about being dragged into a conflict with, with China, if you see what I mean. Is that is the, is the mood that that's the price you pay for the alliance is going, yeah, well, sometimes you've got to turn up. And I, I'll tell you personally, I believe that's exactly what the alliance is built on. The willingness to put skin in the game, to assume risk, to not um, not always allowed the US to go one out to be a reliable partner, um, I think is one of the foundations of the alliance. So Mike, I don't know what you think. No, I, it's it's absolutely right. We When I was at CSIS two years ago, we did a survey and we asked the American people, how much risk should the US take to defend its allies uh, against Chinese attack? And 10 was you know a lot of risk and one was no risk at all. And the mean for the American public was like 8.5. And for elites, it was nine. Um, so Americans, you know, look, in 1941, um, Roosevelt's most important task, as he wrote to Churchill in the Pacific, was to stop Japan from cutting off Australia. It was too important because of the geography uh, and because of our shared values. And um, uh, and what Mark points to in that Lowy poll, which is a very good poll, it is the gold standard, <laughs> um, uh, is interesting because um, Americans and Australians need each other for security more than ever, actually. Um, and that creates a, an interdependence. Um, we can't really fight without Australia and Japan anymore. We need them. And Australia can't survive in this environment without us. And, but when you have two proud sovereign countries, even with common values and a long history, that creates a lot of pain points. That's why I mentioned sovereignty in the beginning. You know, countries don't want to be pulled into a war against their will. You know, the Americans, you know, you know, would like Australia to be signing on to more things. And behind the scenes, there's a lot of goodwill, but a lot of friction working this out. On the health of, of democracy, I was struck that Claire O'Neill, the Home Affairs Minister, has made this a theme in Australia. She's worried about the health of democracy in Australia. There are groups in Australia like the Michigan Militia and the Proud Boys. Um, and um, they don't, there's not been a January 6th in Australia, but Home Affairs is a little bit worried about it. They're watching it because they can see that some of these issues of extremism and politics could be global. Now, that said, Australian politics are really tame <laughs> compared to the US. Part of it is cultural. And as one friend pointed out to me, America fought a revolution, a civil war, the civil rights movement, defining our democracy. And in Australia in 1901, a bunch of guys with long beards signed a document and went to get a pint. So our democracy is a, is a little more raucous, a little more violent. But I also have to say one of the major factors isn't even cultural at all, or it, it, at least it doesn't appear to be. And that is that Australia has compulsory voting. You have to go to the polls in Australia. And whereas in American elections, it's all about turning out the base because you get 50% or so voting. And that really allows extremists on both sides to dominate the parties. And I don't think Americans will ever accept compulsory voting. But you do see in Alaska and maybe in Maine, I can't remember, um, preference voting, list voting, which is the next best thing because it forces people, it forces candidates to play for the center. And like a few structural changes in how we do elections, having watched Australia would, would make a world of difference for us. We'll see if we ever get there. But yeah, list preference voting, that, that'd be the thing to watch in the US. Ranked choice, thank you, someone corrected me. Ranked choice voting which Alaska and a few other places, like Maine doesn't have that yet, does it? We sure do for some of our- Yeah, elections. I thought so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, as in all things, Maine shows the way. <laughs> but Maine's politics are sane, are relatively sane compared to much of the country. That's why we're called result. Virago, I lead. Right. Yeah. That's right. So we just have a couple of minutes left. And so I wanted um, to give both Mark and, and Michael just a chance to um, uh, share any any final final wrap up, wrap up comments that that you you might have, and then we'll we'll turn it back to to our our brave leader. Mark, you want to kick off? 
I'll go first if you want, Mike. Uh, um, look, just very briefly, um, AUKUS is kind of a um, hopefully soon to be physical manifestation of something that's actually built on a bedrock of values, understandings, worldviews, you know, politics, even though our democracy looks very different from yours, as Mike quite rightly points out, that I agree with him 100%. It sounds strange to an American ear, but compulsory voting means you have to capture the middle ground. Uh, I think it was George F. Will that said that he thought baseball was the, the, the great game for American democracy because the worst team still wins a third of the games and the best team still loses, loses a third and it's all about the middle third. I'm not sure that's true anymore in America, but I'll leave my American friends and colleagues to debate that with, in the, my absence. But in Australia, you have to get that somehow through the system and you have to find that compromise. But look, just to reiterate, the AUKUS agreement is about the alliance at its core. And of course, our British colleagues, but at its core, it's about Australia, US alliance. And it's about, it's built on a solid bedrock of common understanding of really important issues and values and history. And it, it will endure long after I've uh, returned to Australia, I can assure you. Um, if I could, uh, Kristen, um, I agree with everything Mark said, including the baseball reference. <laughs> um, and it's a brave thing for an Australian to use base baseball references. I've quickly learned that trying to use cricket, I almost always get it wrong. Um, but um, I just say, since you have a lot of people watching who are um, students or professors at UM and, and elsewhere, um, I'm on leave from Georgetown University um, to do this gig for a few years. And I, I taught like you, Chris, I taught international relations and I taught all this stuff. And um, Americans who are studying international relations don't study Australia. They study China, Japan, maybe Korea, maybe Southeast Asia. And we're now at a point in our re relationship where that kind of quiet, intimate, um, keep the fights inside the room, um, that's not going to work. These are big, hard problems we're talking about with China, with economic coercion, with AUKUS. And um, I'd really encourage students and professors watching to think about bringing Australia into the curriculum more. We have no closer ally, in my view, in the world, um, certainly in the Indo-Pacific, um, but it's not uncomplicated. And if we have got to get our alliances right. And um, I'm doing a bit of that here for Australia and studying the US, but we cannot take it for granted. I think we really have to we as educators, Kirsten, <laughs> we really have to make sure people look at this alliance. It's really consequential. It, it has huge upside opportunity, but it's not a given. It's not a given. And even if we're very close to actually do some of the things we're talking about, it's complicated. And I think pretty interesting. That's why I came here. Pretty interesting stuff. Here, here. Thank you. Over to Allison. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, Kristen, thank you very much for your skilled moderation. This was an absolutely fascinating discussion. As I shared with the panelists, um, the World Affairs Council staff today, we had the opportunity to meet briefly with the um, Consul General for China. Uh, and his first question was, what about this AUKUS? Why is it that the US and Australia feel they need this AUKUS? I say both of you have answered that question quite thoroughly. And so thank you for that. Um, I also wanna thank, of course, our World Affairs Council audience for their excellent questions and for being here this evening. I wanna thank Bill Hall, our past president, for his faithful sponsorship of these webinars, which enable us to offer these um, free to our members, to students and faculty. We have some interesting programs coming up in March. We'll have a screening of the Hong Konger movie, which is of course the Jimmy Lai story. Um, and of course, Great Decisions begins March 21st first at the Falmouth Public Library. Again, Mark, Michael, Kristen, thank you so much for being here. Shout out to Judith and Greg Fergan for making this wonderful connection. And I wish everyone a good night. And for those of you in Maine, stay safe and get your snow plows out. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Thanks for having me. Thanks. 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 I'm off to the beach here. Cheers. <laughs> Enjoy. And I'll be ending the webinar now. <laughs>